Founded in the early 80s by frontman Bill Manspeaker, it seemed unlikely that Green Jello would ever achieve any sort of success. Even though they were dubbed, and I quote, the world's worst band, by the early 90s, Green Jello would get airplay on MTV, sign a production deal with the network, have a gold record, and be in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most band members with around 770. Today, let's explore the history of Green Jello and whatever happened to the band. A combination of punk and metal, the Washington Post perfectly summed up Green Jello's music saying they play nondescript hard rock music unencumbered by weighty lyrics, dress up in costumes that look like mutant Saturday morning cartoon characters created with the budget of a third grade pageant, and saturate the whole package with a sense of humor straight out of a junior high school bathroom. Green Jello is the brainchild of one man. Buffalo native Bill Manspeaker, who grew up under difficult circumstances. Six weeks after he was born, his father would die in an auto accident, and his mother Louise would tell the Buffalo News, It was tough. It was just me and Bill. I always worried about him. You raise a child alone, and you wonder if he will stay out of trouble. Billy was always a great kid with a great imagination, she'd say. But by Manspeaker's own admission, he was a bully in school. He would reveal in the same article, I was always the bully in school. I took karate lessons so I could learn how to beat up little kids better. I learned how to do it with this karate move called the dance of death. I earned my next belt for knowing this. Then I thought, wait a minute, I'm being rewarded because I can snap somebody's back in two and ruin their life? This is stupid. After that, I put all my energy into the band. Manspeaker would name his band after what he thought was the worst menu at his high school cafeteria, and it also served as a characterization of the band's musical abilities. Manspeaker was, and still is, pretty self-deprecating about the band's musical abilities. Green Jello's motto was, we suck, and it was pretty common for him to get audiences who attended their shows to yell, Green Jello sucks. A big musical influence in Manspeaker's life was his uncle, who was an Elvis impersonator in his hometown of Buffalo, using the stage name Big Wheelie. Manspeaker would tell the Washington Post, I thought he was Elvis from my whole childhood, and one day I saw Elvis Presley on TV, and I said, look mom, some guy's imitating Uncle Chuck. It was like, uh, no, Billy. I was devastated. It was worse than finding out my mom was Santa Claus. Unlike a lot of bands who cut their teeth first playing covers, Manspeaker was honest about his band's musical talent, admitting they couldn't do other people's songs justice, telling the Post, We had instruments, but we didn't know how to play them. We decided to make up our own songs so no one would know if we screwed them up. Then we thought we'd dress up in costumes so people would just look at them and not pay attention to the songs, but that still didn't work. Finally, we thought, let's just say we're the world's worst band, then everyone will come and laugh at us. That worked. That's not to say all the musicians who played in the group were bad, as future Tool members Danny Carey and Maynard James Keenan spent time in Green Jello, and they both even played on some of the group's studio albums. Green Jello shows would become synonymous with just having a good time, as the band donned costumes, sprayed the audience with liquids, while they in turn would throw Jello at the band. Of course, their onstage antics got the group banned from quite a few clubs, but one of the band's first big backers would be Bud Burke, who owned the Buffalo establishment, the Continental Club. He booked Green Jello when other clubs said no, and supported them financially during their lean years. One of the first big breaks came in the mid-80s, when Green Jello opened for the Ramones at Buffalo State College, a show which you can actually watch on YouTube. Joey Ramone called them the worst and messiest band to ever open for the Ramones, and in 1984, Green Jello released the EP Let It Be, which was limited to 500 pressings and got an endorsement from Kiss's Paul Stanley in the liner notes. Many of the songs on the EP were later re recorded for the group's subsequent albums. While still in Buffalo and working on Green Jello, Manspeaker was also working at a grocery store in the deli department, telling the Post how things changed for him in 1987, saying, I was tired of being cold and slicing deli meat in Buffalo. I thought, if I'm going to slice deli meat, I might as well be warm. He would move from Buffalo to Los Angeles and take a chance on hitting it big. But unlike a lot of people who found LA to be a culture shock, that wasn't the case for Manspeaker, who admitted to the Buffalo News, Hollywood isn't so great. To me, it's just a glorified version of Grand Street. Soon enough, other members of Green Jello made the trek, moving from Buffalo to Los Angeles, and one of the band's first high-profile appearances would be on The Gong Show, a goal Manspeaker had for ages, with him recalling to the post, it was one of the great moments of my life. To make ends meet while in LA, Manspeaker would work as a cameraman for the cable network E, and the band soon found themselves hooking up with another like-minded band in Guar, who they toured with. By 1989, Green Jello released Triple Hits Live at the Budokan, and contrary to what the title suggests, it was recorded in a garage and was not a live album. 
Again, some of these tracks would be re-released on subsequent albums from the group. It would be a friend of Manspeaker who was looking for a job with a record label who promised to get the band signed someday. That friend would be named Kevin Coogan, who would eventually come to manage the band, and Coogan would eventually land a job with Zoo Entertainment. Coogan would take his new boss, label president Lou Maglia, to a Green Jello show, trying to convince him to sign the band, with Maglia telling the Post, Coogan took me to see them at like 2 o'clock on a Monday morning. Someone threw a beer bottle at the wall above my head and I got covered in glass and beer. I took it as an omen. If I'm standing here at 2 o'clock in the morning, this must mean something. The kids were in a frenzy. I said, this is entertainment. And not too long after that man speaker found himself in Maglia's office, who told him, go home, figure out what you want to do and how much it'll cost and come back to me. Manspeaker offered to do a VHS-only release featuring 11 music videos, which based on several sources I've read, varied in cost from $50,000 to $75,000. Maglia agreed and funded the project, but little did he know that the members of Green Jello used some of that money to throw a huge party, while using the remaining funds to buy some used film equipment and a pile of lumber to shoot their 11 videos. The product of this work would be the 1992 VHS release called Serial Killer, the release would be noted for Green Jello's over-the-top costumes, claymation, and music clips. Zoo Entertainment loved the finished product and included comment postcards with the release. And according to the label, over 6,000 postcards were mailed back to them, with Maglia telling the Washington Post, These kids get the band's sense of humor. They write to them, You guys suck, you're the worst band ever, you made me puke on my shoes. Send me a merchandise catalog. This kid manspeaker is brilliant, he'd say. The same year, the band garnered attention at the CMJ Music Marathon, which used to be a convention and musical festival that's typically held in the fall of each year from 1980 to 2015. The 1992 version of the Music Marathon, Green Jello set, put the entire event in jeopardy when, according to Billboard, the New York Port Authority threatened to shut down the marathon because, and I quote, the band was accused of annoying Wall Street commerce and area business with what the authority called visual and vocal obscenities. Rock radio stations soon took notice of the band, with one DJ in Seattle at the radio station KXRX ripping the song Three Little Pigs from their VHS release and playing it on the air as a joke. But it soon caught on. Other stations started playing the song and it became a huge hit and later appeared on late night pay-per-view channel The Box before invading MTV in the spring of 1993. It would soon become one of the most requested videos on the network and also appearing on the track was Tool's mainer James Keenan, as well as Danny Carey. Soon enough, the Serial Killer VHS tape took the number one spot on the Billboard video sales charts in May of 1993, and to capitalize on the group's popularity, their label scrambled to put out a CD version of Serial Killer's 11-song video release. The move would surprise Manspeaker, he would tell the LA Times, when Zoo first suggested we release a soundtrack CD, we were like, the music is worthless, who's gonna buy it? But they said, we can put you guys on a monthly salary if you release it. We went, sure, do whatever you want, just don't make us go back to our day jobs. Their album would end up going gold selling over half a million copies and peaking at number 23 on the Billboard album charts, while producing a hit with Three Little Pigs which would peak at number 17 on the top 40 charts in America. While the band had a lot to celebrate, they also had a lot of headaches to deal with. Their raised profile soon drew the attention of Kellogg's, which owned the Jell-O trademark and reportedly sued the band. Green Jell-O soon changed their name to Green Jelly with an umlaut above the Y while still pronouncing their name Green Jell-O. In addition to that, it was reported that Kellogg sued the band for trademark infringement of their Toucan Sam character in addition to other characters. The cover of their record depicted Toucan's son of Sam, the serial killer, that kills other Kellogg characters including Snap, Crackle and Pop, the Trix Rabbit and Lucky the Leprechaun and the band had to change the cover art and had to remove the title track from their VHS release. Their legal headaches though didn't end there, as the song Electric Harley House of Love caught the attention of Metallica's management, who filed a lawsuit against the band. Their management claimed the bass and rhythm guitars in the solo section of the song resembled Enter Sandman, and the band even mentions the track using some of the same lyrics. The legal battle will cost the band about $10,000, and they soon had to pull the song from their CD releases, and the music video had to come off MTV. A year after having commercial success, Green Jello put their earnings into opening a production studio called Ooze Jelly. At the studio, they would be capable of producing music videos, video games, and TV shows, and according to Billboard, the studio would be a joint venture between their label Zoo Entertainment and the band, with their label poning up a million dollars buying state-of-the-art video production equipment and building a facility. The Ooze Jelly office would occupy the same studio space that was once owned by Frank Zappa. 
By the time the studio opened its doors in 1994, it was reported that Ooze was working on a pilot for MTV called Stupid Heads that would mix music clips with animation. The idea apparently was to incorporate Green Jello's cast of wacky characters into the program that someone close to the band described as, and I quote, a cross between Beavis and Butthead and the Banana Splits. The band also helped write the soundtrack for the classic Spider-Man video game Maximum Carnage, and Green Jello's band members, who at that point in time varied between 12 to 15 members, were also multi-talented, doing shifts at the office with one guitarist working as a production manager, while a drummer was a video editor, while one of the vocalists was a 3D artist. The band also found some other business opportunities. Some articles I found claimed they signed a deal with Marvel, while others claimed it was DC, to put out their own Green Jello comics. According to the Buffalo News, Manspeaker also signed a $75,000 contract with a clothing company to sell Green Jello t-shirts. The band also used that new studio space to record their follow-up album, 333, but it failed to chart. The band was, however, nominated for a Grammy for the Bear Song from the Dumb and Dumber soundtrack and covered Born to be Wild for the 1995 movie of the same name. But record label issues shelved the band's follow-up material, which wouldn't be released until years later. By the middle of the 90s, the band was finished and the members would go their separate ways. Manspeaker would continue to work with Ooze Entertainment and started a rave club on Hollywood Boulevard called The Quest. But in 2008, the band announced their comeback going out on tour and reissuing their major label debut with Serial Killer in 2009, and finally releasing their long shelf material from the mid-90s and their follow-up record, Music to Insult Your Intelligence By. The band once again was in the news for a reason they didn't expect. In November of 2019, the band would be screwed out of money by a Canadian promoter who refused to pay the group for a show they played in Toronto. Manspeaker would film himself confronting the promoter, and it would result in the band getting half of what they were owed. This month, the band is planning on releasing their latest record, Garbage Band Kids. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll Stories. Take care.